Welcome to the Resilient Recruiter Podcast. My name is Mark Whitby. I'm your host, and I'm here with my special guest, Jordan Lawrence. Jordan founded the Payments and Cards Network around 10 years ago. And since then, he's started a micro niche recruiting group called PCN Capital, which is comprised of Payments and Cards Network, Digital Source, and Secura Capital, and PCM, Payments and Cards Media, with offices in Atlanta, Amsterdam, and Singapore. So Jordan is also the co-founder of Volt Open Banking, www.getvolt.io, with fintech industry expert sourced from his experience with PCN. I'm very proud to call Jordan a client, someone I've known for, I think, five or six years now, and a super smart guy, really excited to uh, have him on the show. Jordan, welcome. Thanks, Mark. It's an honor to be here as well. I've followed your podcast for a long time and obviously your webinars since... Uh, I think actually going back to sort of 2009 or maybe even before, but uh, a long time. So thanks for the invite. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, by the way, I have recently interviewed a couple of mutual acquaintances. One is Christy Brown, who is someone you introduced me to. Great. Yeah, Uh, she's awesome. She is awesome. And um, so her episode is coming out before, just before yours, actually. So, wow, um, that's, that's, really, that's really cool. Yeah, uh, she's an interesting person. Um, and then the other mutual acquaintance, Katie Howard Cross. How do you know Katie? Katie does um, a lot of our induction training, actually, in Amsterdam. So, we use your videos, um, you know, your video training platform. And Katie comes and sort of bolsters that with uh, a week-long induction course, generally, for our, our new starters. Um, she's got a great history of building Fantastic. perm teams, as you know, right? Uh, uh, but building permanent yes. recruitment teams and, is amazing, and, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, Selling Retained Search, she's, she's awesome at as well. Uh, people loved her podcast. She's quite inspiring, especially in terms of, like, uh, female leadership and, and that sort of thing. So, um, so. Jordan, you, uh, you've you got uh, a really successful recruitment business with three offices. I mean, let's just talk, first of all, the elephant in the room, which is COVID-19. And um, I mean, how how are you guys dealing with that and how has it affected your business? Yeah, we try and stay on the positive side of all this and sort of turn off the uh, the news as much as possible. I think the somehow the, the sort of media panic is worse than the, the virus sometimes. Um but look, um, we were set up from day one to be online. All our database is in the cloud, which we were, you know, at the time it was quite early to do. Uh, databases are in the cloud. Everyone is has the ability to work from home. Um, everyone's got laptops. We work off laptops and screens in the offices, which is, has been a great thing. We haven't had to sort of uh, change everyone's working habits. So for now, everyone's working from home. I say everyone, some people, uh, you know, Lewis, for example, who runs our US operation, he's in the office pretty much every day with a a handful of people. Um, But most of the people are working from home. If you want to go into the office, you can. But it's sort of everyone keeps in communication over Slack and WhatsApp. And and we sort of coordinate it so there's not too many people in the the office at any one time. But so far, it's okay. The market, in terms of the market, the three... um, Markets we cover is you know data science, cybersecurity, uh, payments and cards, so fintech space in, in general. These companies are booming. Um, everyone's buying things online now more so than they were because everyone's stuck at home. So the fintech companies we work with are actually uh, doing really really well, posting record profits. In which case, most people are hiring. What we see are the older style fintech companies, and let's say some of the banks who have not. Um, been so good at allowing people to work from home, have had the have had the issues of sort of hiring freezes and things like that. But so far, so good. Uh, I will say uh, it's not the easiest time, um, but it's just a time of sort of uh, you know doubling down and making sure everyone's hitting their KPIs. And we're a very established business, particularly in the financial technology space and the the, the data science space. The cyber one is quite new, but those digital source and the payments and cards network. Uh, we've been around so long that most of our work has always been called in. Um, you know, business development hasn't been such a uh, such a focus, let's say. Whereas now it sort of is trying to find those companies who who um, are still hiring uh, whilst looking after the clients. Um, you know, w- which we've already worked with for a long time. Makes total sense. And um, I guess my big question for you is: 
how do you keep the team motivated and engaged, you know, when you're not, because you guys have a really cool culture and I've been into your office in Amsterdam and, you know, it's kind of, it's a really nice environment. It's a fun place to work and there's a, there's a good buzz, but, um, you know, now everyone is, is separate. So how do you keep everyone motivated, you know, under those circumstances? So we have a lot more uh, FaceTime, let's say, than, than we would have done before, even though the FaceTime is now like this over video. Um, but we've got some some really, really great uh, management in place. You've met uh, quite some of them. Um, Amelie, she runs the French team. Rochia, who is our COO, who runs the Amsterdam office. Um, Louis, who's looking after the US. Simon Richardson, who runs Digital Source. And the, the Brady Gerrards, who's heading up, um, Brady, he heading up uh, Secure People. These are all very experienced management um, recruiters now. And they have really stepped it up in terms of face-to-face com face, face -face communication. So making sure everybody's on top of the teams, helping people out where they're struggling. That can be psychologically, um, you know, in, in these times, people are locked down at home, feeling a bit anxious. Um, so a lot of FaceTime, a lot of face-to-face face -face communication over video. As I say, some people are still going to the office. So every now and again, people will go into the office uh, and just, you know, social distance themselves from each other and just make sure everyone's uh, motivated. But the key point here is uh, as much communication as possible, um, just making sure everyone has as much help as they need to hit those numbers, hit the KPIs, um, and, and so on and so forth. I know that um, you, from the beginning, actually, even before this, you were focused on building a culture where people have a lot of autonomy and are self motivated rather than being micromanaged. Um, has that changed or how, you know, um, how has that influenced kind of the way that you're navigating in the current uh, crisis? So I've always been really focused and we'll, I think we'll get onto this in a moment on hiring self-motivated people. It's It sounds obvious, but it's actually very, very difficult. So we've got some really good things in place uh, to try to hire those self-motivated people. Um, and to this, to this point, everyone's, uh, everyone's sort of stepped up and, and continued that sort of self-motivation, realizing that this is a bit of a crisis, uh, to, to up the game, up the numbers, uh, pick up the phone more than they generally would, and just make sure something's coming out of, um, of, of everything, right? Every single phone call you're getting something from, focusing on the candidates and really switching, switching around from what is standard recruitment to a bit more of a marketing play now getting in front of candidates, getting in front of clients, and just making sure that we are in the face of everybody so that when this starts um, calming down and the recruitment goes back to normal, some degree of normal, um, then we are there in, in pole position um, so, that, so that people pick up the phone to us rather than anyone else. That's what everyone's been focusing on. All right, that makes sense. Um, so you, you mentioned KPIs, like what kinds of things are people um, measured on or, or focused on achieving in terms of, you know, daily, weekly goals? Yeah, so we've switched things around. We use Cube19 in combination with Bullhorn, which we found to be really great over the years. Cube19 in particular, I think is a very useful tool. Um, so we've switched the KPIs around from, let's say, the normal recruitment KPIs, which flows with, you know, pulling jobs, sending out CVs, booking in interviews, closing deals, um, to really heavily focusing on getting CVs out into the marketplace, phoning uh, candidates and phoning uh, clients. As I said to before, we've gone from a sort of very luxurious position where a lot of business comes to us to now a position where we're looking after the clients that are still hiring, which are a lot, but also then filling in those gaps with business development. So the business development side, talking to senior candidates as much as possible, talking to clients as much as possible. So we've upped the outreach side more than anything. That makes sense. So focusing on things that we can control, which is reaching out and initiating conversations with clients and, and candidates. Yeah, every every client that's added to the, to the database now, you know, before it was sort of, we've added a client to the database, great, we're gonna keep in touch. Now it's making sure they realize we're still in the game, we're still hiring, other people are still hiring. So advising the clients a lot more that actually their competition is still hiring. So perhaps you should be too if they're not. Uh, suggesting hiring freezes are, we've done a podcast recently on, on hiring remotely, you know, things like this. 
Um, and on, on the candidate side as well, becoming advisors, reassuring the candidate um, that this is the time to also look for a job, you know. And if your company has got a hiring freeze or things like that, well, perhaps this is not the company you should be in for the long term because another crisis will happen in another 10 years' time probably. <laughs> uh, yeah. Can, you, can we just uh, double-click on that, Jordan, because I, I'm speaking to recruiters who are having deals um, – fall over uh with the, you know, even they they've gone to all this effort to get offers made remotely and then the candidate is getting cold feet because they're sort of thinking well better the devil you know even though they're not happy in their current uh job they the uncertainty in the market is causing them to think twice about about moving what's what are your team kind of doing to sort of encourage and, and reassure candidates? We've had a few of these and 90% of them we've flipped around. One of them in the US, we were unable to flip around, to be honest, um, because th this person had been on, on his honeymoon in Hawaii, actually came back to his job um, and thought, hmm, maybe now is not the time to move. And he could not be convinced to, to join this other company. A lot more transactional in the US, though. People come and go very quickly. In, in Europe, it's much more of a big decision to, to change a job, in my experience. So the message we've been sending to the market and the candidates who have been unsure have been, you know, really along the lines of this is a very short term crisis. When everyone starts hiring again, you're still going to be unhappy. That job that you couldn't make a decision for has gone to somebody else who could make the decision. And the chances are your company is probably not as fast moving as the company that's made you an offer. So is that where you want to be long term? Probably not. Um, so people have sort of slept on these comments, thought about it over a weekend, what have you, and generally come back and said, hey, you're right. You know, I'm going to move forward with it with the new company um, because they're going to be more forward thinking. And again, in, in terms of a crisis situation, if you're going to go with a company who's hiring now, it means they've stabilized themselves for the long term. Whereas your current company probably hasn't, uh, which is why there's a hiring freeze and all this doubt. So there's, a, there's many, many arguments to, to flip it around, but that, that, that's, what, that's been our, uh, our argument. And I, I firmly believe it. This is not a recruitment spiel, right? This is honest advice. Brilliant. Love it. That makes uh, a lot of sense. Jordan, can we talk about something that you guys do brilliantly and better than any other, um, you know, small and fast growing recruiting business that I've come across is building a community with media. So you've leveraged, you've got a magazine, you've got, in fact, a whole media business, you've got your own podcast. Um, can you speak about why and how you did that and what impact it's had on the core recruitment business? Yeah, we hired a marketing um, guy really early out of university. His name was Amir Abdin, actually. This, he's now living in Dubai. He, we hired him out of uh, straight out of university. He'd built a university magazine from scratch. Um, and he said it was really successful in terms of building an internal community. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is a great idea. So let's do it again for the fintech space. This was back in 2009 or 10, I guess. Um, and he, he, so he put this magazine together for the financial technology space. And it went, uh, it went sort of, viral in our industry. I think now there's 150,000 subscribers a month. It's still. Um, and it was, wow. it, we, we saw when, when this marketing uh, executive came on board, that actually there was a huge amount of interest in our business, huge amount of interest in the magazine, because then we were able to actually start interviewing um, our clients, which tied them into our brand even more and helped them grow. So the philosophy became, look, we will give you very cheap break-even cost uh, advertising in a magazine, which is going to get you exposure in a very niche market, which is then going to help you attract uh, candidates and business and help you grow. And then hopefully you can use us to do the recruitment to sustain that growth. So that was the theory. But then off the back of that became um, basically an entire media company on the side of the recruitment. So we've got the magazine, Lewis runs the podcast, which is very successful. It's called uh, In Check with Fintech. Um, so actually, I think I've appeared on, on, on one of those at one point as well. Uh, but we, we sort of now interview uh, C-level people who are all, all of our clients. We've got them in the magazine. Um, so we've built an entire community around using us as a service. And we see other people actually starting to do that as well now, um, build these magazines um, and, and podcasts and all sorts of things like that. So that works really, really well, actually. 
you guys were very early adopters of this. When you say magazine, is this a physical magazine? Is it a digital magazine? What's the what's the format? Yeah, so it's both. Uh, so our, our magazine is available on our website, teampcn.com. There's a whole magazine section there. Um, also, PC, I believe it's paymentsandcardsmagazine.com. It's even there. Um, so it is both physical and digital. Digital, of course, it's great for your uh, search engine optimization, especially if you're working in a niche market like payments and cards, like fintech. So every single um, article is published on our website, which is great for, for the SEO optimization and you're highly advised. Um, on the other side, it's also uh, a PDF, you know, a, a sort of flickable PDF. It's, on, it's online and you can flick through the pages. And we sponsor, from a media perspective, around 200 events a year in our industry. So we, in, so we sort of send out mail shots for them, attract audiences to, to buy tickets to these large events. Some of these event tickets are like $4,000, $5,000. Um, and in exchange, they give us uh, free tickets. And generally, we can appear on panels. We get uh, booths um, in these events for free. So we have a media partnership with around 200 events. And of these key events, let's say three or four a year, we publish a um, printed magazine specifically for that event. So then we print it out, send it to the event. I've physically flown to Las Vegas before and picked up thousands of magazines and dragged them to the event situation and scattered <laughs> them around. Uh, uh, and that's really great because, you know, people then use it as a tool. So they're on their booth, they pick up the magazine, they're in the magazine, they say, hey, look, here's what we're doing. It, it goes down really, really well. That is such a, a brilliant idea. Um, a lot of recruiting firms are not sophisticated when it comes to marketing. They're purely telephone. And then, you know, the, the most forward thinking of them have thought, oh, well, we need social media as well. So they're sort of telephone and social media, you know, LinkedIn. But then you guys are thinking so much uh, bigger than that. So, th so that's brilliant. How did you forge the relationships with the events themselves? Like, um, you know, because... Often recruitment uh, companies will attend these events, but you're really partnering with the with the event hosts in order to help each other. How did you? How did that come about? Yeah, so that came from very very early on when LinkedIn groups were still a, a really a big thing. I started the Payments and Cards Network as a LinkedIn group. It's now the largest uh, group of its kind in the fintech space. It was one of the biggest groups in the world for a long time, but obviously other niches have sort of taken over. So I think there's around 50,000 people in this LinkedIn group, which are vetted. So we hired an intern, which every single day people would try to join the um, payments and cards network group on LinkedIn, and they would vet them individually. So people would join if they were a recruiter, obviously we wouldn't let them in. If they were uh, some random salesperson, we wouldn't let them in. If they were specifically to do with our industry, we'd let them in. That would go on to, go on to a lead sheet and be sent around to the sales team. This is how we sort of grew from that, um, from that networking group in the beginning. Then we started getting events come to us and say, look, you've got 40,000 people in your group. Would you mind doing a blast for us? Um, and we thought, well, hold on a minute. We can sort of leverage this. Yes, we can do a blast for you, but in exchange for tickets or a booth or also some exposure for us, um, then we sort of forged this media partnership. Then that intern we hired full time and it became their KPIs to partner with events, um, you know, partner with as many po as possible events per month as you can uh, and make sure that you're getting tickets and make sure you're getting booths and make sure you're getting uh, exposure for us as well. So it was a sort of two way media relationship and that went on from, from there. And now events will pay us, as I say, or give us tickets to advertise in the magazine, to go out on the group, to go out to our newsletter. So it's, it's a real side business as well. That is amazing. Do you still find value in the LinkedIn group? Because I'm, from what I see, a lot of LinkedIn groups are, are garbage. You know, it's mostly just spammy posts. There's not a whole lot of community or discussion going on. But, you know, what, what, what are you seeing with your LinkedIn group? I think they've let it dilute a little bit. Um, people who do join the LinkedIn group still seem to be quite susceptible to, you know, a phone call. It's a very warm lead still uh, because people, yeah. have, a lot of people still have just discovered these LinkedIn groups. But I see it has diluted quite a bit. It, I think for our group specifically, again, we've been so diligent of letting only relevant people in since day one. Our group remains quite relevant. It was, it's ironic. At the same time as I started the Payments and Cards Network LinkedIn group, I started another one as an experiment um, called the M&A Network. So for all companies interested in mergers and acquisitions. 
I let that be a public group, didn't care who came in. I think there was about 150,000 people in there in the end. I was on holiday somewhere, um, I think about five years ago now, and someone phoned me up and said, do you want to sell the group? And I said, yeah, okay. I think I sold it for about $10,000, this uh, this LinkedIn group. Um, <laughs> oh, cool. But yeah. Bonus. But, well, yeah. But what I'm saying this is because if you keep it focused, I think it is very relevant to a lot of people still. You see the content on that group, which is quite good. But if you just let anybody in and make it a public group, I think it's full of wash. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, I think it also depends on how well you manage that community. And if you have a community, you know, sort of community manager who goes in and starts conversations or makes, you know, brings people together around discussion points, then it can it can be really, really good. I think you're right. And I think actually there is an argument to put someone just managing that group full time. And as as I say, if you have a group of 50,000, 60,000 people, Um, purely focused in one niche and you put someone managing that group, setting them KPIs, what do you want to get out of that group? I think, you know, I think it could be leveraged. So yeah, I I think it depends what you want out of the group really. Um, Yeah. Whether it's going to be relevant or not. Yeah. All right. Interesting. So in addition to the marketing stuff that you guys are doing really, really well with, um, you've done some interesting things to, you know, create a certain culture. We touched on that earlier, but one thing in particular I wanted to ask you about was you have switched to a four-day work week, and that was before COVID-19. Why did you do that, and how is it working for you? Because a lot of businesses will see that as a, a, a big risk. Like, aren't you getting 80% productivity out of people? What's your what's your philosophy around that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and you're right. Was it a good time to do the four day work week uh, just before this pandemic kicked off? Probably not. Uh, but I see actually most of the guys are working pretty much five days a week again now. Um, it had it has been great since the beginning. We started the four four day week. Everyone came back on a, on a Monday very refreshed, um, and it's not a case where you get 80% productivity at all. People seem to step it up because the KPIs are the same, the targets are the same. So now you've got to cram a five-day work week into a four-day work week. Um, so in the beginning, there was a bit of a transition period where we we said, right, okay, we're going to start the four-day work week at the beginning of March, can you believe? Uh, but we February was the ramp-up time. So February was the time where everyone had to prove that they were able to do like 25% more, really, uh, than 25% less, so we could fit in the five days into the four. It's been really, really good. Everyone's really appreciated the extra day of the weekend, of course. Um, but as I say, since the pandemic's kicked off, people, in order to hit those KPIs, have had to work a little bit extra. I, I believe people are working a, a bit more like five days than four at the moment, but it will, obviously, when this turns around again, we will go back to the four days. It's something I've looked at for a long time. I think David Stone, MRL, was one of the first people to kick it off. I've been talking with him a lot over the last couple of years. Um, he's got some great advice and is probably one of the, the pioneers of this four day uh, work week in recruitment specifically. Um, yeah, and, and the results from his team were so good. I said, okay, let, let's give it a go. Um, and look, also <clears throat> to be totally transparent, from a retention perspective and a, and a hiring perspective, um, if you've got people coming from the hardcore seven day a week recruitment shops, right, that uh, maybe would like to get into a bit more of a niche market where it's not in such a flooded environment um, and, and a lot of business comes your way um, and you can work four days a week. Well, this is great from a, from a recruitment perspective and obviously um, a retention perspective. Do people want to leave the four-day week now and go and work five days a week somewhere, uh, especially for another recruitment company? Probably not. So it's very interesting from that side of things as well. I can see it being a huge benefit from a, an attraction and retention point of view of uh, for your internal recruitment. Um, is it? Let me play devil's advocate for a second, Jordan. Like, are people just not working ten days a week on those four days? Like, is it the same number of hours, and and therefore does it, you know, because um, you, you? I don't know. Like, I, I'm just trying to understand how it works in in principle. It's more than than the the, the working days, right? So you're working, yeah probably 10, 12 hours on those four days. But the flow you're in in those four days because you're working like that is 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 great. And then, of course, you have a three-day downtime where is people people before would sort of work really hard over the five days, binge on a, on a, on a Saturday night, perhaps, especially for the, the younger <laughs> crowd uh, going out, you know, having a lot of drinks and stuff. 
barely recovering on the Sunday, then sort of stumbling into work. And then the Monday morning may not be so productive. We get to Friday afternoon, possibly around two o'clock. People start thinking about a beer, you know. So arguably, is there much getting done anyway on a a Monday morning? Talking about the majority of of, of staff in recruitment now, um, is there much getting done on, on, on a Monday morning and a Friday afternoon? I don't know. So now we give people the opportunity to have a real good rest. If you want to go and have a blowout on a Thursday, great. You've got the Friday off. Have a couple of days to recover. Go to the gym a couple of times. Come back on the Monday really refreshed and actually make something out of your Monday morning. Uh, and yeah, and your Thursday afternoon. Thursday is definitely not the new Friday. So um, the, the beer isn't in the hand at, at three o'clock in the afternoon on the Thursday. Um, yeah, so so that's it. And it's very important to then maintain the culture, right? So we would go for drinks on a Friday with the team, for example, um, or have a drink or two in the office on a Friday afternoon. Um, that's still maintained. We've just put somebody in charge of sort of making sure people are still being social together and the whole team building stuff uh, carries on, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a very interesting experiment and I, I'll definitely be paying close attention to what you guys do because, um, you know, you're you're sort of ahead of the, you know, ahead of your time in, from a recruiting, recruiting point of view. I know um, David Stone is doing it, but there's not too many doing it. So... Um, so really, really yeah. Cool. Time will tell. I believe many, many companies will move towards this, uh, you know, four day work week. And I, you know, it's it's interesting times we're in now, where everyone's working from home. People have made the transition to work from home if they haven't done before, company wise. Um, let's see. You know, I, I think people are, are, are even more focused in these times because they're working from home. There's no office distraction. It may be a catalyst to actually people working four days rather than five, given the output that people are doing now. Right. If you can maintain the output, especially that uh, some people are doing at the moment um, in every sales field to try to make ends meet, you know, when this crisis ends. Well, there's definitely an argument for a four day week. Absolutely. I mean, I know flexible working is definitely, you know, trendy at the moment. And um, what what do you think the new normal will be for recruiting businesses? Because I'm still, um, you know, some of my clients were already, you know, experimenting with working from home X number of days a week or or indeed may, maybe had a business model where the whole team was distributed. But the majority are still very much that's not going to work. People need to be in the office. They need to learn from each other, from hearing their manager on the phone. Uh, they need, you know, people are not going to be productive if they're sitting at home. Um, so I can see both sides of the the argument. What what are you predicting for when, you know, we come out the other side of this and, you know, what, what kind of permanent uh, effects do you think this will have? I would not be surprised if people start using their offices more as a flexible space and downsizing, perhaps, uh, people, I think, now will realize, I mean, my office costs in Amsterdam are astronomical and in the US uh, and actually in Singapore, if, if you add them all up, office costs are astronomical. And I think people will start realizing, wait a minute, we could probably downsize the office because everyone is capable of working from home um, and maybe rotate. So have teams in the office a couple of days a week. Those same teams are working from home. The other teams come in. I wouldn't be surprised if people start thinking like this and actually start downsizing their offices to accommodate a working from home strategy. Uh, because also what it does is, is, is weed out the people who are incapable of working from home. Uh, thus, probably not as self-motivated as you'd probably want in a business. So this will actually weed all this out, as I say. And I think people will come to the office as needed um, and prove that they're capable of working from home and in the office and simply go to the office for that sort of social interaction, morale boost with their, with their peers, um, and then continue working from home the rest of the rest of the week. I think we might, we might see more of that. I definitely think we'll see more uh, remote hiring. So let's say people may be reluctant to open an office in the U S as we've done, but maybe they're not so reluctant to hire a couple of remote workers in the U S you know, set up a business, no need for a physical office um, because people have been working from home, for a long, long time. And in fact, you know yourself, in recruitment in the US, it's, it's very unusual for everyone to go to an office every day. Everyone's got uh, you know home setups all over the place. Um, so I think we'll see a lot more of that in Europe, actually, uh, off the back of this. Fantastic, Jordan. And uh, it's really interesting to see. I, I read in uh, BBC News the other day that Barclays Bank are even thinking about, you know, do we 
after this is over, do we want everyone to go back to kind of their skyscrapers in uh, the city of London or, or you know, Manhattan Island or whatever, um, where real estate, you know, costs are so high and, and rent is so high and they might, you know, they might shift away from that. And even in banking, which is a very traditional industry, might encourage more home working. So it'll be interesting to see. We see it with our Speaking clients, of, Mark. I mean, some of our clients are yeah. banks, at least have the banking license, right? They're fintech companies, but they have a banking license. So they're considered a bank. And these are the new style banks, the challenger banks, they call them. And many fintech companies, specifically in Germany, where it's a, you know, it's a very uh, ancient world, the banking space, right? Um, but even even these guys are uh, hiring from people, people from home. We've got a big contract book running uh, in Germany for these fintech companies. And we've had not one contractor laid off um, due to this virus from the banks. Awesome. Wow, that's cool. Jordan, speaking of uh, remote hiring, you did a really interesting event recently, which was a, a webinar uh, called How to Hire Remotely with Confidence. Could you say just a little bit about why you did that and 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 how it worked out for you? Yeah, that was great. Uh, I mean, thanks again for partaking in that, Mark. You did a great job as, as, uh, as hosting that. Um, so that worked out well. As you remember, we had three of our clients on, on a panel, four of our clients on a panel, including Christy, who you've, you've done on a podcast now, which is, uh, which is great to hear. So Christy was in Atlanta. We've had um, two of our clients from Germany and another one sitting in Paris. And these were all companies on the panel who were quite used to hiring remotely, have always hired remotely, actually our banks as well, funnily enough, three of those. Um, and so the idea was that we would do a podcast with yourself um, and a little presentation on the advantages of hiring remotely, asking our clients firsthand in a panel setup how they're hiring remotely to try to teach the rest of the industry who is not hiring remotely how to do it properly. Um, and then follow up with a... Uh, consulting situation, uh, an onboarding document as a handout. So when you have successfully hired people, and then we've gone through that entire list of attendees. I think it was about 280 people had registered in the end. I think a hundred turned up. Um, we've gone through that entire list from a business development perspective, under the assumption that everybody who signed up for a webinar of how to hire remotely was interested in hiring remotely. Um, and that's, that's done well. I'll, I'll be honest. We, a lot of the, the people that uh, attended were actually colleagues of the people doing the the panel, you know, who wanted to see them on there. But that's fine. We've got some new 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 uh, names within existing companies. Some were new. Some companies have reached out, and many many candidates actually, which was surprising. Many people were were looking at that um, panel really to probably um, get a better understanding of the people who are hiring and why to then probably sell back themselves as a candidate uh, to the people that were actually on the panel. So we've had a lot of candidate interest, um, which has been great. And actually, one of them is a fantastic uh, candidate who it looks like we're going we're gonna to place. So I'll be in touch around uh, about that as well. Um, so yeah, that, that was great fun. Um, and as I say, I think, again, doing something that other people aren't doing at the moment, getting yourself in front of your clients, adding value to the market is what's most important right now. Being seen as that recruitment company who is still going strong, who is in contact with everyone all the time. Again, you're going to be the first one they contact when all this ends, rather than sitting in the background doing you know, not a lot. Absolutely. I agree. I And that was a genius idea. I was um, honored to be involved in that because uh, you're full of so many good ideas, <laughs> very creative, fertile, fertile mind, mind. <laughs> for, for business. And uh, so, yeah, I'll be excited to see how that how that turns out. And if you get, you know, even one placement out of it, then that's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, cool. So look, the, the other thing I wanted to pick your brains about was, um, you have a multinational firm. You've got offices in Amsterdam, Atlanta, Singapore. Um, why did you choose to do that rather than just have a sort of bigger head office and then, um, just recruit internationally from there. Cause I certainly do have clients like here in Edinburgh who recruit for big four accountancy practices internationally, but they just do it from Edinburgh. They go and travel to conferences and they meet people, but the team is all in the same office. So why did you do that? And, and how do you manage it? Because the, 
where I've seen branch or remote offices fail is due to lack of strong local leadership to really drive things. Um, and then there's the issue of different, you know, countries, different cultures. What, what What's your thoughts on all that? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And I think if you're working in a mass market, uh, mass market approach, let's say, then you probably can do a lot remotely. But I think if you're really serious and you want to show the market, especially in a niche market that you're in, that you're serious and you're intending to be there for the long term, then it's very important to be local. Um, your, your point about managing people remotely uh, is, is very, very good and um, very poignant because it is quite difficult in the beginning to manage people um, who and keep them motivated when they're on their own to build a team on top of them and go go from there. So we've enlisted local support, Christy Brown being one of them in, in, in the US. She's built, um, again, probably comes out on the podcast with her, but she's built two recruitment companies in the past, uh, I think to about 200 people each and sold them off. So we've enlisted her help to be a consultant to um, our people in Atlanta uh, when I can't be there or Lewis can't be there. Um, and in Singapore, it's still quite early. We've been there a year and a half and we have got the licenses. I mean, Victoria Hammond, who runs our operations, she's head of our people and operations. She's headed up the whole process of getting that Singapore recruitment license, which has been an absolute nightmare. Um, it's taken about a year. Uh, it's not the easiest thing at all to do. Before we got the license, we were able to um, do a lot of recruitment re remotely. But now we have the license, we're actually able to hire local talent, um, some of some of which uh, James Smith is a guy who came from Memorial Bond, actually, who heads up our, um, our Singapore shop. Um, we were able to hire him up, up off the back of getting a license. People are not going to come and work for you until you've got the recruitment license, because, of course, in Singapore, for example, it's illegal. Um, but yeah, back to the point, I think if you're serious about growing globally in a niche market, you have to be on the ground, you have to have FaceTime. It shows you're there uh, for the long haul rather than just making the sort of hit and run deal, which you do see uh, all over the place here. Yeah. So following on from that, could you just speak briefly about, you've done some really cool things in Atlanta in particular, where you've actually partnered with the, uh, like I believe this, the local government um, to, um, promote, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of fintech industry. Could you say how, how you got involved in that? Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, it's again, more sort of thinking outside of the box from just being re a recruiter or a recruitment business to how can you add value to the local economy in the, in the niche that you're trying to service. So Atlanta was a classic example. Um, at one of these events, actually in, in Las Vegas, we met with um, the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. That came around um, by, I, think, I believe, Lewis reaching out to uh, the economic developer of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, um, a guy called Grant Wainscott, whose, whose KPIs was to bring in companies into Atlanta. right? And, and you know that San Francisco, New York, quite saturated with tech companies, quite saturated with fintech companies in, in particular. Where else is there? Well, Atlanta, for example, is called Transaction Alley. 80% of all payments in the US go through Atlanta because all the acquiring banks are there. So there was a bit of a gap. Uh, so Lewis reached out to the Metro Atlanta Chamber. We had this meeting in Las Vegas with, I think, uh, 11 people from the chamber um, who'd spent a lot of money um, on the educational courses, you know, training people to be uh, developers and engineers, uh, and they'd even put a curriculum around the financial technology space in there. So they've put a lot of money into the fintech space. These people were getting their education and then just disappearing off to Austin or uh, or um, San Francisco, purely because there was a lack of fintech companies in Atlanta. So we partnered with them very early to form a sort of transatlantic bridge to help companies in the Netherlands or in Europe uh, realize the potential that Atlanta has for their business uh, and what a warm bath it is to start a, a fintech company in Atlanta versus New York or San Francisco. Um, and we've partnered with them very successfully on that. And we, so we've helped Grant um, fulfill his KPIs by getting companies to Atlanta. And obviously, then when they move to Atlanta, they're going to need to hire everyone. And so we're, we're, we're sat with, uh, with, with the Metro Atlanta there. And that's been a really successful partnership, something we are now trying to imitate in Singapore. That is brilliant. What I like about this approach, the mindset is very much 
one that I've used to grow my business, which is identifying partners that you can collaborate with and initially seeking to help them to achieve their goals. And in so doing, of course, you know, it benefits you as well uh, in the in the long run. And you've done that in, in media, you know, with events companies. You've done that in Atlanta with, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce there to promote fintech companies, you know, moving to Atlanta or opening Atlanta. And then there's a there's a knock on benefit for for you guys. It's it's really, really smart. I think it's just um, making yourself uh, part of the fabric of the industry you're trying to service, right? Rather than being seen as someone only taking. I, I think that's really important, especially, as I say, it works if you're in a niche. If you're in mass market, then okay, you're mass market high volume. But if you're in working in a niche market, which I believe is the future anyway in recruitment, um, then you have to be able to add value some, somewhere along the line beyond just taking. I love it. Great. Um Two, two things quickly, Jordan, I know you've got a call you need to go on to. One is you guys are, uh, you support a, a charity. Could you just speak briefly about that? Yeah, so Free A Girl is a fantastic charity um, set up in the Netherlands. And basically what it came from is that they're, they're trying to, and they are doing a really good job at actually going into places like India where there's sexual slavery, particularly uh, among very young girls who are essentially kept in cages in disgusting in, in environments. And what Free A Girl does is take special forces, local special forces, work with the sp- local governments, as well as international special forces, and goes physically into these locations and frees these, these mainly girls in captivity. Um, and wow. works out how to reintegrate them in society and, and all the rest of it. And actually, um, we've been supporting them for a while with all the events we put together. We always make sure um, that they have a, a pitch, that they're able to speak and tell their story. We always help them raise money. And actually, Rahir, who you know, our CEO, he actually gives part of his quarterly bonus to Free A Girl every single uh Every, every single every single quarter. So we try to support charities in that way as well. I must be honest, that's the main one we support. We're looking always of, of other ones which we can support. Um, but it's a great story. And I, I must say, if you look into Free Girl, it's a fantastic charity. Um, and yeah, I think anybody should be supporting those guys, the, the work they do. Well, that's awesome. And we'll include, we'll include a link to them in, a, in the show notes um, for other people who want to look into that. And uh, final question before you go, can you talk about... Volt, because Volt Open Banking, um, it, it it sounds like you're uh, you've started a company in the space that you also recruit in. How how does that work? Yeah, very tricky. Obviously, if you just go and start a company in the space you're working in, which uh, is essentially in competition with your clients, it probably doesn't go down so well. So, this came about uh, of a regulation change called uh, PSD two, which is all about open banking. So there was a regulation change. Um, one of our clients, which is called IFX Payments, uh, the, the old COO, a guy called Tom Greenwood, um, said, look, do you want to get involved in this regulation change? I'm going to start a new company around uh, around um, open banking payments. Do you want to be involved? So I looked at it and I thought, okay, this does not conflict with, um, with any of our clients because it's a whole new regulation. So uh, I said, yes, let's, let's, let's do it. I didn't realize it would take up quite so much time as it does. But uh, anyway, it's, it's very interesting. And... Um, of course, working in the fintech space for so long now, our network is huge and we've been able to build an unbelievable team. I sit in on these uh, board meetings every month we have with the investors and everything else. And it's fantastic who we've actually got on board. And I think it's going to be a really successful thing. So how does that apply to recruitment? It's actually really great. I didn't realize at the time, but you know, now, I, now I'm speaking to um, board members, CEOs of our potential clients for Vault to do their open banking, uh, process their open banking transactions. But of course, um, the relationship goes goes then, you're, you're a supplier, why not link them up to your recruitment company as well? So then, uh, you know, Rahir or someone in the office will give them a call, say that we're all working together, which we all are, of course, um, and fulfill their recruitment needs as well. So it's, a, it's another angle into recruitment supply via the industry you're already working in. But um, it, it's, it's working out really, really well. And as I say, if you're working in a niche and you understand your market and you can start a business which doesn't conflict with your clients, um, I would highly recommend it. Again, if you've got the time, it takes up a huge amount of time. And luckily, I've got such an amazing management team 
uh, at PCN that they've allowed me the time to uh, to focus on this as well. So it's also a bit of a stroke of luck um, that we've got the, the people in place. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure it's not luck. It's by design, and you've worked very hard to develop people. You know your your next level, next sort of second tier of leadership within the business. But um, so if people want to hear more about Vault Open Banking, it's www.getvault.io. We actually invested uh, Mark in a new URL, <laughs> which uh, oh okay, it's even more expensive Sorry. than Get Vault. It's uh, it's now just Vault.io. Uh, sorry, I didn't update you on that, but yeah, get vault. No io or vault. io work, but uh, yeah, things are things are progressing quickly. Vault. io. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for uh, for correcting me. Well, Jordan, look, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation, and me too. Um, been great. thanks thanks to all those listening to the resilient recruiter. I know how busy recruiters are, and I'm honored that you're investing the time with me each week. I definitely don't take your attention for granted. And that's why I'm going all out to deliver value for you guys, bringing real insights you can apply to improve your business. Fantastic guests like Jordan Lawrence. And if you really want to help me reach a wider audience and impact more people, then please consider giving this show a review on Apple Podcasts. And uh, also hit that subscribe button. I look forward to seeing you next time.